our first panel, and we're going to just kick off. We're actually running ahead of time, which in my world never happens, okay? For some reason, they say I just talk too much and go on and on. But uh, we're going to get this show started. And our first panelists are up on the stage getting nice and nervous sitting in front of uh, all their classmates. But we do have a fantastic group. And as Tim said, this is a very un informal setting and part of the greatness of the Rage Track Business Conference is that you guys out here in the audience are going to get a chance to ask your questions of our great uh, panelists as well. But I get to start it off. So we're going to do introductions, and uh, you guys, as I told you earlier, you're going to get 60 seconds for rebuttal, so that works really good. So in no particular order, uh, we're going to lead off with uh, Diane Fitzgerald. Uh, whether it's on two wheels or four wheels, our first guest is an expert who has learned that one of the fringe benefits of respecting the heritage of motorsports is getting to drive some pretty cool vehicles. And uh, from the RPM Foundation, which stands for Restoration Preservation Mentorship, it's Diane Fitzgerald. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Uh, RPM Foundation has been around since 2005. We're located in Chicago with offices in Tacoma, Washington and Detroit, Michigan. And we are uh, at the center of thought leadership and working the educational pipeline to shop readiness for the next generation of millennials who will be taking care of our cars. In my case, I personally am not a racer, uh, my husband and I had an international motorcycle touring company for years, still have a garage in Milan with our fleet of motorcycles, and um, it enjoyed the two-wheel two world. Uh, but racetracks are very, very important to us personally, my husband and I, but also to RPM Foundation. It's part of the classroom, if you will, the field, where we take the next generation of automotive restoration and repair uh, service providers to meet their uh, future customers and to understand what the jobs are like at the track. And we have a program, complimentary program, that we offer around the United States called Off to the Races with RPM that I'm sure I'll have a chance to tell you about during our uh, panel discussion today. Thank you for having me. And our first uh, panel is uh our sports tourism and education panel, as we often do here at RTBC, we put a very interesting mix of folks up on the uh, podium to talk about different issues. Uh, when it comes to education, well, it took seven pages and most of the alphabet to uh, cover all the degrees this next man has earned over the years. Grooming the next generation in motorsports from Winston-Salem State University, Clay Harshaw. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, kind of like Diane, I've not raced myself. Uh, I grew into racing through my parents. Uh, they both raced SCCA, uh, Jim Connor, and Road Rally. Uh, as I, and as a kid, I, my brother sat in the front seat with my mom. I sat on the back shelf of an Austin Healey Bug Eye Sprite. Still my favorite car. Uh, Winston-Salem State University has the first standalone four-year degree in motorsport management. Uh, lots of technical programs in the country, but uh, not too many to uh, just focus on business. And that's all we do is the business side of racing. Uh, we're right there, uh, a track that some of y'all might be familiar with, uh, Bowman Gray Stadium. Uh, my office looks out over turn four, which is great during the spring whenever they have uh, weekday practice. <laughs> Can't get a bit of work done. But uh, <laughs> it's a great location. Uh, and this, uh, I've been to the RTBC several years now, uh, working with Tim. And uh, it's a great opportunity for me to come up here and uh, talk with you all. Thank you. All right, folks. The best way uh, to plan for the future is to learn from the past. I spent 25 years as a weather forecaster because, before I got into this crazy industry, and I kind of know how that goes. Uh, our next guest is a master at strategic planning, and I'm kind of wondering, Rob, uh, 
Can you give me an analysis right now on whether my voice will hold up through the whole show? <laughs> From Hunden Strategic Partners, Rob Hunden. Thank you, sir. Good morning. I cannot, uh, I actually can't imagine you on the Weather Channel braving the uh, hurricanes and, and all of that. Yeah, I had a face for radio. Oh, got it, got it. Okay. Well, speaking of radio, um, I grew up here um, listening to the Indy 500 on the radio, as we can only do here. And it wasn't until I moved to Chicago that I realized you could watch it on TV. Um, but yeah, so, anyway, just a, a little bit about us. Um, uh, my firm, Hunden Strategic Partners, is based in Chicago. We do market and financial feasibility studies, economic, fiscal, and employment impact studies, tourism and placemaking um, strategies and planning, um, as well as uh, developer selection processes and, and all manner of other things uh, related to uh, real estate development and destination development. And uh, started off here, went to Indiana University, uh, focused on finance, uh, went to D.C. and came back and, and ended up working uh, at the Indianapolis Local Public Improvement Bond Bank and the mayor's office. Um, Doug Bowles was there at the time as the special assistant to the mayor for motorsports, and obviously he's had a terrible career since then. Um, and, uh, and, and so we were, we were all about making Indianapolis better at the time as a place for events, for motorsports, for all these other things, including the expansion of this facility here, the development of the Marriott across the street and the whole Marriott complex that's, uh, that's down the street. Um, so that's where I started, um, but really my focus has always been on creating that destination, that place, and making those things as utilizable or, or utilized as possible so that they are financially feasible. We've got our friends from Atessa here in, uh, in, uh, in Arizona who we worked with um, recently. And, and all of these projects are, um, the focus is how do you make them so efficient and um, utilized and impactful that the public sector recognizes that, puts in their fair share, and you can have a financially uh, uh, feasible and sustainable business. So we'll be talking about all those things potentially today. Thank you. All right, kicking off the first round of questions. And again, as uh, you're going to see throughout the day, um, while this question leading off will be aimed at one particular guest, I'm sure that our other panelists will have lots to say as well. So Diane, I'm going to start with you. We hear all about this, uh, you know, millennial generation, whatever came after millennials, uh, don't love their cars as much as, as my generation did. Are we actually making that situation worse? Hmm. I think we're making it better. Um, and actually, we're not making anything. Uh, my small team, we've got a, a small staff and volunteer ambassadors around the United States. And in the last three years, we have traveled uh, 250,000 miles around the United States looking for the next generation of what we call craftsmen and artisans. Uh, we call them that in part uh, as a little bit of a sidebar to overcome the grease monkey perception that is still persistent today. Um, so, and the technology and the, the decision making, the thought processes lend themselves more to craftsmanship and artistry rather than um, grease monkeyness. And what we have found around the United States is that there are thousands of kids who love cars. They just uh, express that a little bit differently and because the educational pipeline is so different now from when we were graduating from high school in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, they're unknown entities. And part of what our job is with RPM is to let them know that there's a career path in automotive restoration and preservation, motorcycle restoration and preservation. We happen to also uh, spend some time with classic boat uh, restoration and preservation. So the next generation is out there, and I actually think they get a little bit of a bad rap, those millennials and the generations that follow them, because this is, this is kind of, a, I guess, a chronic um, perception of them. 
whenever uh, shop owners, in, in looking for the students around the United States, we're also looking for the shops, and we're trying to not be a placement service, but make matches between uh, the future craftsmen and artisans and the shops that have retiring uh, shop workers. And the shop owners, almost 100% of the time, call the millennials this. <laughs> that's, that's all they say. And uh, we've done an analysis, and this uh, is an example of how we put ourselves in a thought leadership position. We did an analysis of today's shop owners, of which there are thousands of restoration and performance shops around the United States. And we discovered that most of them graduated in the years that I just said, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And conservatively, upon graduation when they were 18 years old, um, they probably had 1,800 hours of what we call under the hood time. And that's informal and formal training from when they were 15. So it was 15, 16, 17, 18 year old. That 18 year old, today's shop owner who wants to retire, uh, had 1,800 hours of under the hood time. Compare that with today's students who love, in our case, we're focused, uh, focused on vintage racing, who love the classic cars being used for vintage racing. And some of them have never changed a tire. Some of them have no idea how to change oil or the need for oil in cars. And um, what RPM has decided to focus on among quite a uh, big list of things to focus on is how to inform them about this as a career path, again, by taking them out into the field and to um, show them the feasibility of a good career and life uh, by being in this industry. So they, the millennials are out there uh, with zero um, hours of under the hood because shop classes were taken away, et cetera, compared with the culture clash that they're experiencing with the shop owners because the shop owners are hiring them thinking they have 1,800 hours of time under, right? And the, you know, it just gets to be a cultural clash mess. And we're trying to um, be at that intersection and helping out. And I've got to say, uh, the, the team of ambassadors that we have is led by Lynn St. James, who, is, uh, who has, love, ha has heritage in her own heart, but a passion for the next generation and educational causes. And we're extremely lucky to have her as part of RPM. I'm done. <laughs> and here's the thing, guys. You don't have to wait on me to call on you. So jump on in if you have a response, please. Uh, uh, one of the things Diane was saying, you know, about changing oil, uh, that sort of thing. I literally watched this happen uh, at my university. My office is up by the athletic department. I saw three football players come out to their car look at the flat tire that I saw walking up towards the place, all three get in the car and drive away. <laughs> With, and a coach was screaming at them, stop, because they don't know how to do this. And my, I've got a daughter who's 16, almost ready to get the license, and before she can do that, I'm going to make her change the tire in the driveway. I'm not going to help her. So she's going to have to learn how to do this. And what I really need to do is take her in and say, this is how you change the oil. This is how you check the oil. We don't do that enough uh, with new drivers. The other thing that uh, I see, too, and I think that Mike Rowe, you know, the dirty jobs guy, really pushes this, is in high schools uh, and society in particular, we keep telling everybody, you have to go to college. If you don't go to college, your job's not good. Well, my job in 30 years probably won't be here. It's going to be on a computer. So uh, and I keep telling my students, develop those skills that cannot be sent overseas. Develop skills that can't be done on a computer. And you know, I have a friend that's a, an engineer. And he's always worried his job's going to be sent overseas. He works for Volvo. So uh, and he's got a friend whose son want, is at college age. The son wants to go into diesel mechanics. That's two years. 
comes out making better than 50 a year versus going to a four-year school plus a master's degree because you can't get a job now without a master's degree in some cases and making less money and having student debt. So and I know this sounds weird coming from a college professor. If you don't, you know, if you've got children or if you've got folks that they don't, they're not really brought towards that idea of going to college, they don't have to go. Some of the most successful people I know never went to college. And they're not uneducated. They're educated on their own. So uh, I think that that's part of what we need. You know, the like shop classes. I graduated high school in the eight, early 80s. We had shop classes. I wish I'd taken shop classes. Uh, it's got to be more fun than <laughs> derivatives. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I would just piggyback onto that. I was just uh, at an economic development conference last week talking about the, the, the very same thing. It's impossible to get a plumber today. It's impossible to get an electrician. They make more money than half of us, I'm sure. Uh, they're doing very well. If, and, and I think there will always be that, that desire for people to work with their hands, work with actual things and not in a virtual world. Um, you see a lot of the kids today, instead of being fascinated by cars, they're fascinated by drones and sort of creating these drone businesses. Maybe there's a way to sort of tie them together. Racetracks are huge expanses of real estate that could be great for drone racing competitions and things, maybe uh, in tandem with cars underneath, who knows. But um, I, would, I would just echo that and, and, and say all those same things. I mean, there is, there is an absolute um, need for that, for those folks with those skill sets. Um, and it's not being pushed, and, and so I think there's going to be a potentially a revolution, but at least an evolution in, in education going forward so that there is more like the German model where you sort of bifurcate into either trades and doing things with your hands or um, higher education, book smart kind of stuff. So it'll be interesting to see. One of the coolest stories that I got to cover this year was a young racer out of central Indiana, Sarah Elrod. Uh, this was a kid that had a lot of talent, uh, just couldn't make uh, her own break in the racing world. So she became a welder, went to work for Doug Wright at his shop as a welder. He was so impressed with her work ethic, now she's racing his race car on the weekends and she's welding during the week. This is an, ed an illustration of what happens when you're actually not allergic to hard work. Speaking of hard work, Clay, this business is a tough business. What kind of uh, opportunities exist in the racing industry? Name something, really. Uh, that's one of the things, you know, it's such a vast industry. And it's, uh, it's like the first time I came to PRI, I was just amazed at the scope of everything. Uh, you know, I, I came through sport management, so dealing with, uh, say, football and baseball, and I, then coming into motorsport, you look at uh, you know, manufacturers. How many helmet manufacturers are there for football? Maybe two. And then you come here and there's 40 <laughs> or more. You know, and every little piece of the engine. And so you know, I, one of the things that was, I try to get across to my students is what you see on Sunday on television is probably less than 10% of the industry. That, you know, that's the final entertainment portion of it. It's the manufacturing that's important to us. It's the facility. So, you know, every, I kind of look at this as, as much more than a sport. That is really, a lot of these are manufacturing jobs, but, uh, you know, there are PR jobs for teams, manufacturers, tracks, uh, marketing operations, there are all kinds of positions available. The thing that I see coming up a lot now is for, uh, the social media aspect and how to use social media correctly, trying to connect with the younger generation. Uh, you know, I ask my students a lot. I've got two of my students here, so y'all can grill them later. Uh, you know, what are we using? Uh, you know, what's the social media of the day? 
apparently it's Snapchat. I'm barely getting on to uh, Instagram and understanding how to use it. You know, Facebook's for old guys like me and connecting with families. So I'm doing Facebook, Instagram, a little bit of Twitter, and still trying to learn what Snapchat is. Uh, the you know, connecting with folks through LinkedIn. Uh, you know, but there are, we now have jobs that are solely for social media, uh, and lots of different opportunities for us there, uh, regardless of what you want to do. Rob, what uh, type of uh, things that you see are, uh, you know, the folks that you want to be working with in this industry? I run into a lot of people, and they don't seem to be quite trained right because they're not coming from clay or they're not working with RPM. Well, I, I think the, the industry and what it touches is so vast. Uh, you can't possibly know everything you need to know. Um, and, and it really does, it touches, you know, advertising and marketing and manufacturing and, and real estate development and tourism, so many different things. I don't think you can ever know all you need to know. And so it's good to be here and, and network. Um, you know, I don't have any um, magic answers about um, any of it other than we can all learn from our peers. And, you know, I think that's what we do in our studies. I mean, I am absolutely not a racing expert per se, uh, but we go in and we do our due diligence on your competitive situation on the market that, that you can attract. We look to see how Others of you have performed in other similar situations domestically or around the world, and, and we all try to learn from each other. And I think that's one of the neat things that I like about this industry is everybody's willing to talk to everybody. Maybe not share all their data. Um, that's the hardest thing that we run into because you know, we do convention center consulting too, and most of those are owned by the public sector, so they sort of have to share their data. Most of the race courses around the country are private, and so we have to sort of uh, get you drunk first or something. So, um, but, but no, I think there, there's absolutely a lot to learn. Um, I think one of, the, one of the real opportunities is, but also challenges, is trying to figure out, you, you pour so m much money into these assets that get used a handful of times a year. How can you make that, um, how, how can you stretch that out and, and make sure that it is utilized uh, more times throughout the year? And so I think one of the things we like to look at and learn from you know, is what, the, what they did in Austin, for example, or, or, or what they do in Fort Worth, or what they do at Indy, or different places where they're getting very creative, and there are many others out there, uh, very creative with the non-racing um, and racing-related things that they're doing uh, 365 days a year, if they can, to sort of maximize that utilization. Uh, so I don't know if that answered any questions, but, um, you know, I think for, for us, we think this is a business and an industry that is worth sustaining and enhancing, and yet it is such a struggle that we want to make sure that we're sharing those, those little tidbits that can help um, from one place to another so they can add another couple hundred thousand dollars in revenue and make that real estate and that business sustainable. And Diane, I'm amazed at how the rest, uh, restoration world and the vintage racing world are colliding. And those vintage racing um, positions, and even if you're volunteering and helping out, that's a great way to learn more about this industry in a hurry. Well, one of the things, yes it is, and one of the things that we um, do in our mentoring of RPM students, and by the way, we're not a school. We talk about RPM students as if we are a school, but we're uh, really a mentoring network. And we coach uh, the kids on how to interview. We uh, help them review their resumes. We um, inspire them to write their car guy stories, which are extrapolated and used as their cover letters of introduction. And every single um, program that we offer around the United States, the students who attend, and we usually on average have about 40 or 70, they're from different schools uh, with whom we have relationships who always have teachers who are above and beyond the call of duty. Almost 100% of the time, those, uh, those above and beyond the call of duty teachers are car guys. And in my world, car guy means uh, they've got a 1964 and a half Mustang-ish in their driveway. 
Um, we um, almost always result in some of these programs with kids getting jobs on the spot, usually for internships, short term, 10 weeks while they're still students. Uh, but occasionally with apprenticeships, which are long term, usually about six months or a year. And we also encourage what we call self-education, uh, where a student who is not knowledgeable in an area of a technical skill that's required for a job they're interested in, we help them figure out how to learn that skill. If they're not learning it in their formal education environment, how to identify something in their community, like an exotic car dealership, where they can shadow a staffer and um, begin the self-education process. One of the things that we found that really helps in terms of that culture clash that I was talking about before, uh, the older shop owners, dealership owners, people of industry like ourselves, and the next generation, is if they come to a site where they're interested in shadowing, with the job description, including technical skills required, of the place they want to work, or intern or apprentice, having that in hand is unbelievably helpful because more times than not, we work with 18 to 25 plus or minus year old people. And more times than not, they haven't experienced the industry enough to really know where that job kind of settles into the industry um, work pipeline. And so having that gives credibility and there have been zero times when RPM students have approached business leaders with a request to shadow, that means for free, the kids work for free, um, and they have not been accepted. And then, of course, we can go down the percentage list of how often they get hired for after school help on a part time basis, and then an internship and apprenticeship, and it goes from there. From our point of view with RPM, it's about being in the field and meeting you, cultivating relationships with you, working side by side with you, and becoming integrated in the industry, which, by the way, is the other thing that we have a problem with. The grease monkey is a problem, and I don't want my son working for a hobby industry who's gonna move back with me when I'm 40 years old. <laughs> and, and so we try to illustrate all of the businesses, industries, in our economy that are based on hobbies, of which there are many. Uh, uh, one thing to touch on uh, what Diane was saying there about uh, experiences, and one of the things that we do a lot of is field experience for our students. So we take them to the tracks and have them work with organizations. Uh, we've got a relationship with uh, Martinsville Speedway where students will work in the media center and see the, watch the whole operation, help them manage all that. Uh, we've worked with uh, you know, marketing folks at NHRA events where what they're doing is the hands-on literal setup and breakdown. And you know, the, the highlight of the weekend is loading the truck on Sunday night, uh, which, uh, uh, it, but it gets them to see that this is what you have to do and it builds their network. Uh, and I've had uh, a couple of folks that they'll call me before they come to Charlotte. We're about 60 minutes from Charlotte. And they'll say, we're going to be here. Can you give me some students to help out? And so they're building their network, that, which, you know, y'all know, motorsports is a closed industry for the most part. If you weren't born into it, you're going to have a tough time getting an internship. So this gives them the opportunity to do that. Uh, and the other part is for that final semester, students are doing a full-time internship, 40-hour uh, weeks for at least 12 weeks. So uh, they are really getting into it. Uh, and the internships, you know, a lot of times what happens in sport internships is, here, go make copies for us. Bring me a cup of coffee. Uh, our students you know, know to say, Okay, I'll do that for you, but give me an actual project. And they really do some actual work for the organization. So if y'all need, um, it's not volunteer, but interns who are learning and you want to develop, you know, 
an internship program where you're teaching the next generation, you know, let me know. I'll be happy to send you folks. And if I could piggyback on to the education side of it, I think we also need to educate the adults. Um, and so how many people, it's just good to know your audience, so how many people here are associated with an actual facility of some sort? Okay, so a good chunk of the room. Um, and how many are um, involved in promoting um, events at facilities? Okay, so yeah, so one of the things that, that we work with and we see all the time is there's, there's a, a misunderstanding or just maybe a disconnect um, from elected officials, from economic development officials and tourism officials about uh, the impact that you have. And there are, uh, we know this is a cost intensive business um, and typically most of the incentives uh, that are out there for uh, reinvestment in your facilities um, are focused on uh, hard development costs and those sorts of things even though you have other costs that occur all the time and you usually have sort of this roller coaster of just one or two or three major events a year and then many smaller events. Um, we, we did a uh, we did a 25% rebate of project costs associated with the Kentucky Speedway when they upgraded from their original format to a format to host NASCAR. Um, and so that was one where, because of the incentives offered in Kentucky, we were able to take something that was event-driven and apply it to real estate development and, um, and, and rebate of that through, through a sales tax incentive because there is such an impact from people coming from outside of Kentucky, and so the, the Commonwealth was very happy to, to be involved in that, bringing folks from outside. Um, and yet, when um, they uh, win something like the Ryder Cup or, or something for golf, and they want to promote a tournament and get incentives for that, or if you want to incentivize a race or a specific event to come to your facility, those are much harder to get, those, those types of um, uh, grants or things from tourism agencies are much harder to get. Um, so if there's a way that you can turn, turn an event around and say, if we, if we invest in our course or courses to increase what we're able to do, then we will be able to land these marquee events, then those types of um, hard development items are more often available for incentives, but you have to make that case to tourism, economic development, state legislatures and, and mayors and, and all those folks that you know, come around once a year when it's fun, but the, three, the other 364 days a year, it's hard to get their attention. So I think that's, that's just another piece of the education process that needs to continually be out there is that one, the, the sort of episodic impact that you have, but the ongoing impact that you have and how that then filters through all these other things that we've been talking about. Okay, guys, so I've always wanted to be a game show host, so I'm going to throw my first toss-up question of the day out to this group. But then I'm going to open it up for questions from the audience, and we're going to actually have two roving microphones today so we can hit both sides of the room. So if you have a question, please raise your hand so I can find you. But your toss-up question concerns a story that was told here at RTBC a couple of years ago. Robin Miller was talking about uh, the surveys at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And he said this year, the survey said that the average customer is a white male age 54. Next year, the survey will say that it's a white male age 55, and so on and so on. Is connecting with that younger generation, maybe even we do it where they live, not on MySpace, but uh, you know, on Snapchat, is that really critical to the survival of the sport? Uh, I'll, I'll start. I think, you know, as somebody who um, is in, in interested in sharing the impact of major events with the people around you and, and literally having to sort of pull people into watching TV today. Um, TV advertising finally was re uh, eclipsed by digital advertising as of 2017 and, and that trend will continue. But the watching of TV, and we've seen this with ESPN and, and all the others, it is not the, it's not the go-to anymore. People are playing video games or they're watching things online or on their phones or on their tablets. So 
um, the traditions that at least existed for 50 years in front of the television don't exist anymore. And so I think it's really critical that every industry that sort of maintained a life um, on TV, which racing did in many ways, shapes, and forms, uh, find ways to be relevant to today's generation in those areas where they are spending their time, because otherwise they're just totally tuned out. They don't get the traditions that I think are so cool at the beginning of these races, at the beginnings of these events, and and it's just, it's just, they're totally lost. I mean, they just don't get why it's a big deal. And so maybe that's just going to be nostalgia for for us, uh, the, who, those of us who are, you know, Generation X and above. But um, I think we can either start new traditions or find new ways to connect with the younger generations through these new mediums. And I think we're going to have to, or, or it will be sort of curtains for us. Uh, I, I would agree with you. I love the tradition. Uh, like you said, at the beginning of the race, uh, there are times where all I want to do is go to the pre-race. You know, uh, once the race starts, um, depending on how long the race is, I'm, I'm might be checked out after about 50 laps. You know, and I'm kind of on that cusp between baby boomer and whatever what comes after. But, uh, you know, I like the new formats. And I think that was part of what you have to do is make it interesting for that generation. You know, the pre-race, the flyovers, all of that's really exciting stuff to me. Uh, and so I, I finally got my family to go. My wife and daughters have no interest in racing whatsoever. And... I got them to go to uh, Virginia International for an IMSA race. They loved all the stuff at the beginning of it, but once they started racing, they were kind of checked out. Uh, and they don't get the, you know, the full experience of all the sounds and all. So um, I think, you know, part of that making it interesting, trying to, you know, we talk about, oh, we need to shorten the NASCAR race. Well, that might be something we could look at. I, know, I remember Phoenix re used to run a 500-mile race, didn't they? Didn't they ever run? It's, has it always been kilometer? Yeah, that was Okay, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, you know, maybe we could go to certain races, maybe go to kilometers. You know, uh, there are iconic races. The Daytona 500, the Brickyard 400, the I'm old, the world 600, need to stay that length. But there are other races that maybe could be shorter. I think that with uh, local tracks, maybe looking at other options as well. Uh, I have a little bit of a cycling background, and there's a type of track event called a miss and out, where after a certain number of laps, whoever's in last place gets black flagged and removed from the track. So you end up with the top, you know, depending on car count, top, say, eight drivers out there. The race never stops. It, it keeps going. It's just that whoever's in last place on those laps gets removed, uh, which uh, I kind of enjoyed the stage races this year within uh, NASCAR because it, it made the middle of the race more interesting and made a reason to try to win or try to stay up top. Yeah, just another thought. Um, one of the things that's happened in another industry that might be somewhat similar is um, is uh, music. Um, with everything going online, everybody can instantly download whatever they want, and so artists aren't able to make money selling albums anymore like they used to. They're, they're still getting some income, obviously, from iTunes and that sort of thing, but it's much tougher. So what we've actually seen, there was the rise in the 90s of the amphitheaters, and then that, that sort of fell. But then, as this has all changed with digital, you have the, the music and concert scene has absolutely exploded. Um, because that's the main way they can still make money now and stay relevant. So you have, you know, generations and generations of bands and performers out there performing in all manner of venues, the ticket sales, the prices for those tickets all continue to go up. And so one of the, and live entertainment is, and, and social experiences, those are things that 
all generations sort of yearn for. We're sort of in our, our computers and our phones and our, our laptops and all that at Starbucks or wherever, but we, we still want to be in a social space. We maybe want to record it and do it live, Snapchat, whatever. So can we somehow take that idea from the music industry and translate it to motorsports, which is absolutely experiential and a sort of mass crowd event, and make that um, happen more often and, and maybe more where these people are. Maybe, maybe there are more, you know, close down the streets downtown of your local community and do a, a, a little road race. Not anything massive, but maybe there are ways to sort of reach out and touch those folks and say, hey, this is really cool too. But because it's often that track and it happens once a year, you, you have to really want to do it. So maybe we just put it out in front of people where they can't avoid it. And I'd like to um, answer your question by volunteering my ringer to speak from the audience about her thoughts on the life and times of racetracks and the next generation. Boy, thanks for that pitch. Um, <laughs> well, I, first of all, I'm kind of maybe going to go in another direction rather than just addressing that. But I, you know, I am amazed yet, yet how we all talk about this um, for a long time about how we get new fans, how we get younger people, and this whole education disconnect still continues to exist. I mean, we're hosting this weekend or this for the show for the first time. Ivy Tech, uh, you know, technology community college is coming out, and they're like they've never been to the PRI show, you know, and yet it's happening right, you know, in in their town. And I remember a number of years ago going to the auto sports show in, in London and seeing where there was a whole section of that show where every institution, educational institution, actually had an exhibit. So they really integrate the whole educational um, experience with motorsports. And so we're working our butts off trying to get 40 or 50 or 60 students to go to a racetrack, which we can get the kids, but to try to get the track to really understand what we're trying to do um, and why we're trying to do it. And they, and they get it, but it's still a matter of it takes a lot of time for them to get it. You've got to get to the right people and yada, yada, yada. So I just think we aren't integrating and collaborating enough with the whole educational um, institutions all around the country at racetracks. I, I, got, I got to tell you this because it was so cool. I got to race at Bonneville for the first time. Um, we wanted to do it forever. and. And the weather wasn't great for the first day, and it's a whole different experience anyway. But, but 14 school buses showed up um, and so on Friday. And so the Utah um, Salt Flats Association, they actually work with the local schools there, and all these kids came. And then I was afraid, okay, is this one of those you know, day trips where then the kids are all just going to hang out with each other? But no, I mean, they were really looking at the cars and walking around and, and asking questions and and we're fully engaged. So I just think we still need to do a better job on an ongoing basis of exposing all types of motorsports experiences, but can get educational programs to do that rather than trying to just sell tickets to them on Snapchat or whatever. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. When you uh, give us a question, introduce yourself to the audience, please. Good morning, uh, Mitch Wright. Uh, NCM Motorsports Park in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Um, we're not necessarily a, a spectator or professional race type venue. We're more designed around recreational motorsports. And some of the challenges uh, that we face, uh, and obviously looking at uh, an aging participant base, is you know, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what we do to encourage, because as you mentioned, there is a car culture out there that um, that we want to tap into. We made a, some small inroads, but I'd like to hear what your ideas on how to, how to deal in, how to get involved and in, in infiltrate uh, that car culture. Lynn? <laughs> I think we're 10 years late in doing the proactive discussing and collaborating that is happening now. The reason I think that is that there are probably five times as many U's as there are students from my standpoint, who want to work with you. 
and they also would turn into the fan base. Um, the, the word can be spread and it's easy enough to, to find these kids. The way we find these kids are through the above and beyond the call of duty teachers who reek of car guyness. And um, communications and the channels for communications I think is the way to go and networking and carrying on after something like this. I mean, this is the first day of the rest of our lives of this network and we can tap into each other and be aware. But um, I think that even though the numbers are off, I think it's just a matter of a few years before those numbers are more in sync, where there is a bigger population of the millennials and younger who are coming to the concerts called racetracks and using the motorsports. You know, I, in what I do, we're, we're looking to train and educate and self-educate. So I got asked a couple of times are you, about our Off to the Races program. Um, are, why are we trying to cultivate the next generation of racers? And I said, we're, we're bringing people to the track so that they can see everything that goes on there. And if they come away a fan, uh, that's fantastic. If they come away a collector, if they come away any one of the other sides of the equation, not the worker, but the collector, then it's a better situation for all of us. Back to Lynn. <laughs> You, you need to find somebody like a Diane who is willing to do the frickin' work, you know? I mean, she actually is, calls these, you know, finds those instructors. So it takes somebody with passion within your organization, it, whether it's a, a part-timer or whatever, but somebody that just says, I'm gonna find and work this um, and, and be able to fit, you know, to kind of um, find that audience and, and figure out how to do it. But it really takes, she works really hard at it and, and then tells me what I'm supposed to do. But um, it just takes somebody with that kind of passion. Uh, Pat Johnson with uh, Atessa in Arizona. Uh, the project that's been being developed for the last couple of years. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I was asked by some people down in Casa Grande to participate in a board called Arizona at Work. Arizona at Work is an outreach of the state government. It used to be part of the Department of Economic Security on Employment. It's job training is what it's all about. And there's a group of people that are on this board, leaders in the community and, and uh, people that are creating jobs. We have a problem uh, in Casa Grande. Uh, based on what we know is coming between our project and several others that are already on the planning and zoning, in the next five years, in a town of 85,000 people, we need 30,000 workers just for the new stuff. That is an absolutely ridiculous number. And the problem is, is how do we do that? How do we get people? Well, we started working with the junior college. I'd love to have, Joanne, your people work with us because they're doing things. Their welding company or uh, division out at the junior college just had a competition where they welded up go-karts and then raced them, had the whole, whole deal right on site. And that was, uh, that was teams from all over the United States that came to that. Uh, but they're also training people and working with us. If I tell them that I need these jobs, they're willing to train people at the junior college level, which is much quicker in the outreach to the high schools. And love to have you guys come down and work with that program because that's where we're finding them, is working from the high schools on up. Right. And the high schools is feeders into whatever post-secondary education which could be certificate and you know months. It could be the two-year uh, associate's degree, the four-year degree, or some other version like that. Yeah. East Valley Institute of Technology. Okay, folks, uh, we've gotten to the end of this uh, presentation pretty quick, but I want a final word. And, and here's what I will encourage throughout the day. If we don't get to your question or if a question pops up 10 minutes from now, write it down and email the panelists. I know that everybody who is speaking today at RTBC always does a great job of getting back to them because they responded pretty quick to me, too. So, Rob, we're going to let you uh, wrap things up for your final words. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, we just 
absolutely appreciate being here. I love the, the collaboration and the willingness to share information and data. So I want to meet with as many of you as possible so that we can keep those um, collaborations and sharing of data going forward and also learn from each other how we can make uh, both these facilities and the, uh, and the sport more sustainable and more impactful for the communities around us. So that's what I would say. I love data. It makes me excited. Um, so uh, happy to share and glad to be here. And if you're looking out and trying to reach um, the, uh, the, the tourism dollars world, uh, Rob's organization will be great at helping you out with that as well. We've worked in 45 states. Yep. Clay, your final words. Uh, one thing I would say, you know, something that you've know, touched on is getting in contact with colleges. You know, nearly every college has a business department if they don't have sport management. You know, contact these colleges. They love to have guest speakers and you know, go and talk about your industry, what kind of problems you're having. Sometimes the, the professors will make assignments for the students to use your program as a case study and then present it to you. So you can get some you know, different folks involved in it. Uh, and you know, I guess that's one way too to bring uh, the next generation into the industry. Diane, your final thoughts. Well, I appreciate um, being here and also being here in the first panel. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the other panels kind of weave in topically and um, uh, the excitement and tone of the possibilities for the future. Um, I am going to be here through the day. I've got literature uh, that describes what we do, and um, I'd be happy at lunch if any of you want to join me to tell you how we do it a little bit more than what you heard uh, from me today. Fantastic job, panelists. What did we learn today? This is another thing that we started doing at RTBC a couple of years ago, and, you know, I'm all, the only one that gets to decide what we learned today. Uh, number one, this generation still has its car lovers. They need more hands-on time, and they just express their love for cars in different ways. We need to reach out to them and find them where they live. There are lots of different ways to make a living in this race and world of ours. Get trained and work hard, and you will succeed. And number three, help the next generation by being a mentor you're not only going to help that next generation, but you're going to help the racing industry as a whole as well. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our great speakers. <laughs>